So yes, we're, we're at our end here, um, returning to our beginning. Uh, we're going to look today uh, now at Perpetua, who uh, died in 203, so one of the early martyrs of the church. Uh, and she left an account of the days just before her martyrdom after she had been arrested. Uh, so I want to look at her account with you to f ask what it tells us about how early, un early Christians understood what martyrdom is. This was in a time when even the word was new, martyr. So they are in the process of defining martyrdom, constructing it, if you like, and so it's really valuable to go back and look at them and see what it looks like. One thing I've been excited by during this really rich day of lectures is um, the echoes that I have heard in each talk um, of Perpetua. So see if you hear the same thing as we go through. And I want to talk about Perpetua particularly uh, in, as the way she sees martyrdom in scriptural germs, the way in which scripture and her life are so interwoven in her experience of martyrdom that um, scripture can be said to be shaping. Do not be conformed to this age, Paul says in his letter to the Romans, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. For Perpetua, who was a young mother, a prophet in her church community, and finally a martyr for Christ in the year 203, Paul's bold contrast between this age and the new world that is dawning, even now, in the people of Christ, stands at the center of the gospel. Martyrdom is, as Perpetua renders it, a contest of cosmic proportions, an agon, thought out and won in her own life. And it's a contest not only between a young woman and her father, between a young mother and her grief and fear, though it is that. It's a contest also between the powers of this world, Rome, and the devil himself, and this woman, together with assorted slaves and freedmen, who takes the name of Christ. Christian assume I am a Christian, Perpetua says. Let the agon, the battle of the ages, begin. When she presents her experience as an agon in this way, the word agon is simply the Greek word that um, means a contest, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. When she presents her experience as an agon, um, she stands in a line of Jewish and Christian accounts of martyrdom that extend after her account, and as far back as for Maccabees, perhaps late first century CE. So she's not being original, but what is striking and, and has not really been explored very much is the extent to which the agon trope in Perpetua's hand interprets scripture and the Pauline literature in particular, or perhaps better the extent to which scripture for Perpetua renders the agon and so her martyrdom. So as we go along, I'm going to do three things. First, I'm going to seek to draw out the scriptural shape of Perpetua's passion, and I'll pay special attention to Paul. I will begin where Perpetua begins, uh, establishing in the opening and closing scenes that her experience is uh, properly understood as an agon. And then we'll look briefly at the agon in Paul and then proceed through Perpetua's passion, reading her narrative against the background of the letters associated with Paul. And I hope it will become clear that her passion, for all its immediacy and emotional force, is in fact an act of scriptural interpretation. Paul's account of his own life as an agon serves as a framework within which Perpetua rewrites the disintegrative experience of imprisonment and public humiliation to emerge hand in hand with Felicitas as victor in Christ, even over Rome. So let's turn to Perpetua's passion. In the year 203 AD, a small group of young people in Roman North Africa 
were arrested for converting to Christianity. Uh, they were catechumens and they were on the point of being baptized and that's why uh, and when they were arrested. This is uh, a, a remains of the forum in Tiburbo Mayas, which is where um, Perpetua was probably from. It's not far from Roman Carthage in present day Tunisia. You can still visit Carthage. In fact, I, I had the wonderful experience of living there for um, a few months as a teenager. So I have been able to walk uh, in Perpetua's footsteps, as it were, because um, the tradition is that she was, in fact, um, thrown to the beast in Carthage. We're not absolutely sure that's where it happened, but that's the best tradition we have. So the sentence <clears throat> that these young people uh, received was damnatio ad bestias on 6th or 7th March 203. 7th March is now Perpetua's Beast Day. They were thrown to the beasts in the Roman arena at Carthage as part of the festivities for the birthday of the emperor's son, Geta. One of them was a young woman named Perpetua. Oh, that's another picture of Carthage today with Roman ruins in the foreground. There's Perpetua in a mosaic uh, found in the church at Ravenna. The editor tells us the, the count has her words in the middle and at, as, has an introduction and a conclusion written by one or two editors. So the editor tells us, introducing her, that she was well born, liberally educated, honorably married, with father and mother and two brothers, and an infant son still at the breast. She was about 22. There is a question as to whether she wrote the narrative herself. The editor who introduces her narrative and writes the concluding account of the martyrdom assures us that it is written by her own hand. Um, but some scholars have doubts. I'm not going to rehearse the debate since we have limited time. But uh, like uh, Heffernan, who is a, 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 someone who spent a long time with Perpetua's passion, I'm convinced after reading it that it is her own voice we are hearing. The, the, it's, her voice is fresh and colloquial and entirely different from the editor's voice. It's full of the color of everyday North African Latin. Um, and Tertullian, uh, shortly after 203, between 207 and 211, already cites one of her dream visions from this account. So there's good reason to believe that the account is authentic, if to some degree edited. And so it offers us a window onto this early Christian experience of martyrdom in their own words a woman's reading of martyrdom in Roman Carthage in the early third century AD. It's a vivid and personal account, full of baby and father and mother and brother, of dream serpents and a dark prison, of love and grief and terror and joy. But in and through these real things, it is also quite deliberately an agon like Paul's a passion like Christ's. A scripturally rendered reading of her martyrdom accomplished not by citation, but by a kind of total immersion in Paul's agonistic vision. From the beginning, Perpetua sets the agonistic scene. Now here's her own words. While we were still with our guards, she says, my father wanted to overthrow me with words and kept trying to cause my fall because of his affection. Perpetua begins abruptly. She gives no background, no account of her arrest. She says nothing about her companions. Yet these opening words establish what is for her the crucial context. This is an agon, a contest, a conflict, even a battle. And the stakes are high. A where today, she says, my father wished to overthrow me. Perseverarat deicere. My father kept trying to cast me down. These are military verbs and violent. Her father wishes to overthrow her as an army overthrows a city. Her father wishes to cause her to falter as an army forces the enemy to fall back. 
This martyrdom that now begins is a battle. At the end of her account, Perpetua explicitly calls her martyrdom an agon. She dreams that she is stripped down and facing a giant Egyptian in the arena, which has to be one of the most wonderful pieces of writing we have from, that, from the early church. I saw a huge excited crowd, she says, and since I knew that I was condemned to be thrown to the beasts, I was amazed because the beasts were not being set upon me. Then a hideous Egyptian came out to fight me with his attendants. Her own seconds, handsome young men, strip her and rub her down with oil, as is usual in the Agon, she says. And we'll come back to this crucial scene later. Agon is, of course, the right word for a gladiatorial fight in the arena. But Perpetua claims it for her martyrdom as a woman as a criminal, as a traitor to Rome, condemned not to fight, but to be thrown naked and weaponless to the beasts. From the start, Perpetua sees herself as a contestant in a grand struggle. And this is interesting in, in light of our first lecture. Um, watch as we go through uh, how something that is fundamentally humiliating, becomes noble. She's not, as I said before, she's not the first one to do this. For, for Maccabees, for instance, has a description of uh, the martyrdom of a Jewish mother and her seven sons, which is also described as an agon. Uh, truly divine, the narrator comments, when it is at long last all over, was the agon in which they were engaged. And the passage expands upon the agonistic image. Eleazar was the first to compete. Then the mother of seven sons entered the contest. And the brothers continued the competition. The tyrant was the antagonist. And the world and the human race were the spectators. Reverence for God was the victor and gave the crown to her. So she's recalling this tradition but in particular, her account is valuable because it allows us to trace in detail the way in which she founds the tradition in Paul. And now we're going to turn to Paul for a minute. Like Perpetua, Paul describes himself as an agonist. Pas o agonizomenos, every contestant in the games, he says to the Corinthians, disciplines himself in all things and they to receive a perishable crown, but we an imperishable. As a witness to Christ, Paul is an agonist. And those of you who've done Greek know what the word witness is in Greek, right? Say the word that we now use for martyr. Paul doesn't call himself a martyr. The word doesn't yet have that sense, but he calls himself a witness that his work is to witness, as is true elsewhere in the New Testament. Paul is an agonist as a witness, and he competes for the crown. It's a contest, indeed, in which he not only runs, but fights. So I do not fight as if I'm beating the air, but I pummel my body and subdue it. Like Perpetua, Paul, and only Paul in the New Testament, calls this contest his gospel witness, and Agon. This grace has been given to you, Paul writes to the Philippians, for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him, engaging in the same contest, Agona, which you saw in me and now hear about in me. The term Agon itself appears six times in Paul and the literature associated with Paul, including First and Second Timothy and Hebrews, and nowhere else in the New Testament. Paul links the, his agon, the contest in which he's engaged, explicitly to his witness to Christ. Hold to the word of life that you heard from me, he urges the Philippians, so that you may be my boast in the day of Christ that I did not run in vain. That's the contest. And his converts, 
are his crown. So, my brothers and sisters, he says towards the end of the letter, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown. Stand firm in the Lord, beloved. He's winning a race in his proclamation. He's winning a battle. Their faith is his victory in the day of the Lord. In their faith in Christ Jesus, his race is won. So far, Paul's and the Maccabees' appeal to the Agon fits nicely within a Stoic framework. The emphasis on self-discipline, life as a labor that wins a crown, life as a suffering that wins a crown. But in Philippians, Paul's agon describes not just as in 1 Corinthians the discipline he imposes upon his body for the sake of his witness to Christ, but the suffering that is imposed upon his body for the sake of that witness. His agon in Philippians is specifically his imprisonment. In my bonds, he says to the Philippians, I hold you in my heart. This is something of a departure from the philosophical script. For the contest in which Paul is engaged in his witness to Christ involves suffering not nobly, as Aristotle uh, recommended for the display of the virtue of courage, a noble death as the ultimate display of courage, not nobly as an athlete or a warrior, but in humiliation as a criminal or a slave. Prison in the age of Rome is not where the winners were found. It's not here that the soldiers win glory or the athletes a crown. And yet, it is prison that Paul claims for the place of his victory, and his chains are the marks of the fight. Fast forward now to Perpetua. Arrested for her Christian confession, Perpetua is plunged into a struggle which she, like Paul, names an agon. She is baptized, which took some courage, because the, what was illegal was becoming a Christian, not already being one. So she's arrested, then she is baptized, confirming her conversion. And immediately, she is thrown into prison. O oh, diem asperum, she cries, O oh, bitter day. I was terrified in the prison, she says, because quia numquam experta eram tales tenebras, because I had never experienced such darkness. Aestus varidus turbarum beneficio, the terrible heat, she says, the stifling crowd, the soldiers roughing up the prisoners for bribes. Most of all, I was tormented by worry for my baby there. This is an accurate description of the misery of a Roman prison and a mother's fear and worry for her, her, her little baby. Perpetua is telling it like it is. But she's doing more, too. She's constructing her martyrdom as an agon and her suffering as a victory after the manner of Paul. Very often, I was in prison, Paul says to the Corinthians, in making his ironic claim to apostolic fame, in labor and pain, through sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, very often without food, cold and naked, and besides all this, my burden day by day, my worry for all the churches. O oh, bitter day, Perpetua says, thrown in prison, the darkness, the heat, the rough treatment from the guards, and besides all this, my worry for my child. In Perpetua's experience, the, the Pauline agon is emerging, complete with bonds and beatings, heat and hunger and care, the suffering that is in the eyes of the world, a humiliation, because Paul is quite clear about this. If I must boast, he says at the end of that catalog of hardships, I will boast in my weakness. Suffering is thus the necessary shape of Christian witness, part of the plot for Perpetua as it is for Paul. Immediately before she's thrown into prison, Perpetua is, says, we were baptized 
and the spirit told me that I should ask nothing from the water except sufferentium cadmus, the suffering of the flesh or the suffering of the body. You have been given this gift for Christ's sake, Paul says to his converts in Philippi, not only to believe in him, but to suffer for him. And recalling to the Thessalonians, they're turning to Christ, he says, you became imitators of us and of the Lord, receiving the word in great affliction and with joy in the Holy Spirit. Affliction and joy, remember those two things. When Perpetua says that the gift she is to ask from the water of baptism is suffering, she sounds like Paul. Sufferentium carmen. The phrase intends both suffering and also endurance. And one of our lecturers talked about endurance in, in Aquinas, I believe it was, as the shape which courage takes um, in the Christian uh, dispensation. The endurance of the flesh that suffering teaches. We boast in our sufferings, Paul says, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance character and character hope and hope does not disappoint in Romans chapter 5. And then later he tells the Romans themselves, rejoice always and endure in suffering. Baptism for both Perpetua and Paul plunges the believer into a contest that takes the shape of suffering and its endurance. In Philippians, of course, Paul explains why. Have the same mind in yourselves that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, taking the form of a slave, being born in the likeness of a human being and found in the form of a man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Sufferentiam Cardinus is the shape of life in Christ, because it was the shape of Christ's life. Paul sets in opposition constantly the honor of the world and the cross of Christ. And that's why his appropriation of the agon image is so brilliant, because it is an image in the Roman uh, dispensation of glory, right? Of, of the, the athlete who wins uh, the, the glorious victory, and Paul, takes this to describe the shape of suffering and humiliation. Same way in Perpetua's passion. Perpetua honeste nata, that means well-born and well-educated, Roman matron, is thrown into a dank dungeon with the lowest criminals and condemned ad bestias to be thrown to the beasts. This is not the usual penalty for the honestiores, Roman citizens, the well-born. They were to be killed by the sword or sent into exile. The arena, like the cross, is a humiliation that's reserved for slaves and criminals, and in this case, for Christians. From honor to the endurance of a suffering that is humiliation, this is the shape um, of Perpetua's passion, and in this, she is um, fulfilling, as it were, the Pauline vision of what it means to live in Christ. But Perpetua, at the same time as she claims this shape of life that is suffering and humiliation, rewrites the humiliation. Paul has to focus primarily on rewriting the agon so that it can be understand, understood, so that super apostleship can be understood as suffering and humiliation. Perpetua goes sort of in the opposite direction. The experience of being thrown to the beasts, usually naked and tied to a stake or trapped naked in a net, rendered in this way both bestial and helpless, this public humiliation is transformed in Perpetua's telling into an agon, the contest in which an athlete or a gladiator competes for the prize. 
But in this second uh, transformation of the agon, she still sounds like Paul. Because Christ's suffering in Paul's vision doesn't stand alone. The cross of Christ is juxtaposed with Christ's glory. At the end of the uh, Christ hymn in Philippians, wherefore God highly exalted him, giving him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow on heaven and on earth and under the earth. Jesus' humiliation and that of his followers declares the victory of God. From the beginning, in her account, Perpetua has the victory in the name of Christ. To go back to that beginning, her father confronts her, begging her to renounce the name Christian, seeking, she says, to cause my fall. But she conquers him in the name of Christ, she tells us. She tells him that, as a water jug can only be called what it is, a water jug, So she can only be called a Christian. And he throws himself upon her like one demon-possessed, as if to tear out her eyes. But he cannot, and he goes away, Perpetua tells us, defeated, victus. The young woman has a victory over her father, an inversion, of course, of the power structures of the day. And in this, she hints, we're here at the very beginning of her account, that there is more than her own fate at issue in her martyrdom. In her agon, she confronts in the name of Christ the powers that be. My father threw himself upon me to tear out my eyes, but he only vexed me, and he went away defeated with his arguments of the devil, cum argumentis diaboli. This is not just wicked or diabolical arguments as it's sometimes translated, but deliberately the devil's arguments. Perpetua does battle not just with her father, she's suggesting, but with the power of evil. That this is in fact what Perpetua means to say becomes clear in the dream vision that follows. Because in this dream vision, she steps on the ancient serpent's head. Perpetua, who is already known in the Christian community as a prophet, asks God for a dream so that she might know whether they are to suffer the passion or whether they might be delivered. Video, she says, I see a bronze ladder amazingly high, reaching up to heaven and narrow, and on the sides of the ladder every kind of steel weapon attached. There were swords there, lances, hooks, knives, daggers, so that if anyone tried to climb up carelessly or not looking up, she would be torn and her flesh would stick to the weapons. At the foot of the ladder there was, she says, a serpent lying there, amazing in size, who lies in wait to trap those who would ascend and terrify them so that they cannot climb up. And I said, Perpetua tells us, it will not harm me in the name of Christ. And she steps on the serpent's head in her dream vision. Then she climbs through the sharp steel unharmed into paradise. At the name of Jesus, Paul says, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. It will not harm me, Perpetua says, in the name of Christ. Now as she faces uh, her passion in this moment, she is able to step on the serpent's head. There's something bigger going on in her own martyrdom than her own victory. She's subduing the serpent. She's overturning Eve's sin. The reign of God, perhaps, is already breaking in upon the world. And it's in her martyrdom that it happens. Then I woke, Perpetua says, and we understood that the passion lay ahead, and we began to have no hope in this world, in Segula. Why no hope in this world? Because in Perpetua's passion, suffered in the name of Jesus Christ, the time of this world is already coming to an end. She has already defeated in her father the devil's arguments. In her dream passion, 
She has stepped on Satan's head. She will, in her fervent prayers for her pagan younger brother, while she's in prison, see him rescued from hell and healed, playing happily by the fount of heaven. In her suffering for Christ, which begins with her baptism into Christ, the power of the devil to destroy is overturned. As the account continues, it becomes clear that Perpetua confronts in her passion not only the power of the devil, but the power of this world too. For the power of the serpent to destroy is a power as her vision of the latter makes clear with its steel and knives and swords, a power that's known in the Roman arena. And the arguments of the devil come out of the mouth of her father, upstanding citizen of Rome. Her interchange with her father is, is hard for us to read. We can't understand why she sees her father's apparently heartfelt affection as so offensive. But from per Perpetua's perspective, it's her father's affection that is the problem. Because in that affection, he represents the claim of Rome. It's pietas. Have pity, daughter, her father says to her when the trial is about to take place. Have pity on my gray hair. Have pity on your father, if I am worthy to be called your father. If with these hands I brought you up to this flower of your age, do not make me an object of public shame. Notice what it is her father appeals to here. He appeals chiefly to his loss of face. Do not make me an object of public shame. Think of your family, he goes on, your mother, your brothers, your little son. Do not destroy us all. How would her martyrdom destroy them? He does not go on to say we could not, uh, our hearts could not survive. He goes on to say, if you are condemned, none of us will be able to speak libere, freely, without constraint, as a free person with the respect due a freeborn person again. Her Christian confession will taint the whole family. Perpetua's father is appealing to the claim of Pietas. Pius Aeneas, fleeing burning Troy, carries his old father on his back, and thus Rome is founded. Pietas, displayed in his respect for his father, is Aeneas's primary virtue and the value that undergirds the empire. It's the loyalty owed by children to their parents, by families to the ancestors, by citizens to their emperor, by Romans to their gods. It was enacted in the daily rituals of the household, in the lares and penates and their worship, and in the public rituals of the state, including the sacrifice to the well-being of the emperor. You can see how, um, how challenging it was to live as a Christian in the middle of this um, culture of Pietas. Augustine, in his sermon on Perpetua's Passion, observes that her father is a useful diabolic tool because she owes him Pietas in this you know, chain of loyalties that stretches from the ancestors to uh, the emperor and the pagan gods. This he was saying, Perpetua tells us, as a father, for the sake of Pietas. In her father, Perpetua confronts the most that structures the empire. When she refuses the claim of Pietas in the name of Christ, Perpetua refuses the claim of Rome. At her trial, the governor, Hilarianus, happy one, Hilarianus, underscores her father's plea. Spare your father's white head. Spare your infant son. Sacrifice for the well-being of the emperor. I will not do it, Perpetua said. Hilarianus, are you a Christian, he said. And I replied, Christiana sum. I am a Christian. In the name of Christ, Perpetua confronts the power of Rome. But it is not she, but her father, who is cast down. 
And when my father kept standing there to try to cause my fall, Hilarianus ordered him to be thrown down. Margaret Cotter Lynch uh, has noted the way in which Perpetua, standing in front of the governor on trial for her life, becomes in her confession of Christ the one who holds the power. At one point, her father calls her Domina, Lady, the feminine of the word Dominus, Lord, also used for God. Every, I was reminded um, when um, on our last talk uh, of this by one of the prayers that we heard. Um, the martyr overcame the torturers and shattered the feeble power of demons. There is more that is being won than one person's courage. Indeed, with wonderful humor, Perpetua has the victory not only over her father, but over the governor too. Then we were condemned to the beasts, Perpetua concludes, and Hilares, full of joy, and appropriating the governor's name, we descended into the prison. Perpetua's condemnation by Rome is in her eyes the moment of triumph over Rome. Do not be conformed to this world, to eoni tuto, Paul says to the Christians at Rome. And now we have some sense of what is at stake in that. It's huge. We no longer had any hope in this world, in seculo, Perpetua says, and Hilares, happily, she and her fellow prisoners subvert the power of the governor to condemn as their descent into the prison's darkness is transformed into an ascent into joy. Rejoice in the Lord always, Paul says to the Philippians from his prison cell. And again I say, rejoice. Perpetua's account ends with her last dream vision. On the day before we were to fight, led in her dream by a hard and twisting way into the middle of the arena, she sees not wild beasts, but to her surprise, the repulsive Egyptian ready to fight her. She prepares for the contest. She is stripped. Et facta sum masculus. I was made man, she says. She is rubbed down with oil, as is the custom in agone, in the contest, and they fight. Here's her words. He kept trying to grab my feet, but I kicked him in the face with my heels. And I was lifted up into the air, and I began to kick him without, so to speak, touching the ground. Finally, she grabs the giant Egyptian in a chokehold. She, he falls on his face, and she puts her foot on his head. Shades of the serpent. As she has conquered her father, as she has stepped on the serpent's head, now in her dream vision, she steps on the gladiator's head in the Roman arena. In her last battle, Perpetua rewrites the world, turning victim into victor and death into victory, beating Rome at its own game. In one more way, in this last vision, Perpetua interprets Paul. Et facta sum masculus, she says, as she is stripped and prepared for the fight, and I was made a man. It is, in Perpetua's world, a practical transformation, as only a man can fight a gladiator. But it is more than this. In Perpetua's Latin, it is striking, because it's grammatically impossible. The noun and its predicate must agree. Perpetua's I is feminine, facta sum. I was made. But what she was made is masculine, facta sum, masculus. Perpetua, in her last battle, is herself. I want to, you know, I, I, I want to make clear that she does not, the, her um, identity as woman does not disappear. She is herself. Daughter, the prize giver calls her when she conquers the Egyptian and receives the prize. Daughter, peace be with you. Perpetua is herself, this young Roman woman. And she is also a man. There is no Jew or Greek, there is no slave or free, there is no male or female, 
for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Perpetua hears quite concretely in her passion Paul's promise for the new life that belongs to those who have put on Christ. Perpetua's account ends here. The editor who finishes the account of the martyrdom seems to hear the echo of Galatians in Perpetua's last dream vision. And so we'll finish with this. In his conclusion to the Passion, he also draws on Galatians. When Perpetua's um, fellow catechumen, the slave Felicitas, is giving birth to her baby in prison, let's see Felicitas here. There's Felicitas on the bottom in the garb that's befitting a slave, and Perpetua on the top, uh, same mosaic from Ravenna in her noble woman's um, clothes. She's giving birth to her baby in prison and the guard taunts her because she cries out in pain. If you're suffering so much now, what will you do when you're thrown to the beasts, he says. Felicitas replies in the editor's words, now it is I who suffer, but there another will be in me who will suffer for me because I also am going to suffer for him. It is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me, Paul says to the Philippians. In their martyrdom, these young people look to the fulfillment of Paul's hope. I have suffered the loss of all things, that I may gain Christ and be found in him. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death. Philippians 3. Felicitas must give up her baby, but she will gain Christ. There, she says, in agone, another will be in me. And again, I was reminded of this by another of the martyr's prayers that we just heard. I die on your behalf that I may live in you. There it is already, at the beginning of the third century. This fulfillment of hope that comes through suffering in agone is a fulfillment that is not merely spiritual. Perpetua expects sufferentiam carne, the suffering, of, carnis, the suffering of the body, and Felicitas, in the editor's words, graphically locates Christ in me like a baby is in the womb. This is about a real death, after all, and so the cost is real and the victory is real too. In their last moments, as the editor tells the story, Perpetua and Felicitas, noblewoman and slave, face a mad cow together. First Perpetua and then Felicitas is gored and tossed half conscious to the ground. Perpetua gets up and seeing Felicitas on the ground, she walks over to her and takes her hand and helps her up. And the two women stood together, the narrator recounts. Vivia perpetua honesta nata and felicitas the slave stand in the name of Christ in the center of the Roman arena, hand in hand. There is no Jew or Greek, there is no slave or free, there is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus and two young women enacting his words in their own passion declare before the eyes of Rome the victory of the new world in Christ. Far from hearing in Paul a limitation of her witness as a woman, Perpetua claims Paul's witness for her own. The death that is her witness in Christ leads in this woman's vision through suffering to glory the defeat of empire and the ancient servant. And it leads to life. Daughter, peace be with you. She hears the prize bearer say, as in her vision she steps on the foul Egyptian's head, and I began to go with glory, Perpetua says, to the gate of life. Perpetua sees with eyes shaped by Paul's vision of the life in Christ as an agon, and she claims both agon and victory for her own. Thank you.